Never mind, I'll find function like you. Compute the inverse function is what I do. Don't forget, though, I beg that you can only do that if you start with the function that is one to one. Yeah, if you start with the function that is one to one. All right, so what we're going to do in this video is study inverse functions. Okay, so what we want to do today is study inverse functions, but let me start by giving you an explicit example of an inverse function. So let me define a function capital F of t, which is a function that converts temperatures and Celsius degrees to Fahrenheit degrees. This is something that might be very useful in everyday life, and you probably know how it goes, so if you're given a temperature in Celsius degrees, to get the temperature in Fahrenheit degrees, you need to multiply by 9 over 5 and add 32. All right, what is the inverse function in this case? Well, the inverse function, which we will denote as f minus 1 of t, minus 1 does not mean reciprocal here, it means inverse function. Well, it will do the exact inverse process. So it will start with taking a temperature in Fahrenheit degrees and converting it into a temperature in Celsius degrees. And what does it look like? Well, you could obtain that by solving the previous equation for t. What you'll get is that the inverse function is given by 5 over 9 times t minus 32. So in other words, you take a temperature in Fahrenheit, remove 32, multiply by 5 over 9, and you get the temperature in Celsius degrees. So this is an example of an inverse function. And what we'll do in this video is study the general theory of inverse functions. Okay, so in general, to be able to define the inverse of a function f, we must require that f is a one-to-one -one function. So let me first recall what one-to-one -one functions are. So a function f is one-to-one, -one, or injective, if it never takes the same value twice. What that means is that for any two x1 and x2 that are different, the output of the function f of x1 must also be different from f of x2. So if you think of a function as being a map between the domain and the range, then a one-to-one -one function would be an assignment that looks like this, where to every two points that are different in the domain, I'll assign different points in the image. So that's a one-to-one -one function. Now an example of a function that would not be one-to-one -one would be something like this, an assignment where I take two points in the domain and map them to the same point in the range. So this is not one-to-one. -one. It's two-to-one -one in this example. Now you can also see what happens from the graph of the function point of view. So a function that is one-to-one -one will have a graph, for example, that would look like this, right? So for any two points here, two x's, the output of the function must be different. So this would be one-to-one. -one. Now an example of a function that would not be one-to-one -one would be something like this. If I take function like this, this is not one-to-one -one because there are, for example, two points here that will have, somewhere here, will have the exact same y value, right? So this is not a one-to-one -one function. And in fact, that leads me to something called the horizontal line test to determine whether a function is one-to-one -one or not. So what this test is saying is that a function is one to one if and only if, this symbol means if and only if, no horizontal line intersects its graph more than once. And that makes sense, right? If you have a function which is such that if I find a horizontal line here, for example this function, that crosses the graph more than once, so twice in this case, that means there will be two x1, two points here, x1 and x2, which will have the same y value. So the function will not be one-to-one. -one. This function, the first one, does satisfy the horizontal line test. For any horizontal line, they intersect the graph at most once. So there will never be two x1 and x2, different x1 and x2s that will have the same output value. All right, so that's a very useful test to determine whether a function is one-to-one. 
Okay, so let me now define what the inverse function of a one-to-one -one function is. So recall from the first example that if a function does a certain thing, for example, convert Celsius to Fahrenheit, then we want the inverse function to do the exact opposite, to undo what the function was doing. Okay, so how do we define that? So let f be a one-to-one -one function with domain A and range B. Then its inverse function, f minus 1, has domain B and range A. And it's defined by the following rule. y is equal to f of x if and only if the inverse function applied to y is equal to x. So let's understand what that means. So if I think of my function as being an assignment between its domain and its range, I'm assuming that it's one-to-one, -one, so to every two points in the domain I'll assign different points in the range. So my function would look like something like that. Now what I want the inverse function to do is do the exact opposite, to basically start here and give me back the point that I started with. Right? This is what I would like the inverse function to do. And that's exactly what the definition does for me. So what the definition is saying is that if y is the result of applying f to the point x, then if I apply f minus 1 to y, I'll go back to x. So that makes sense. So this is exactly the right definition for uh, what we think of as an inverse function. Now it's important to note, if the function was not 1 to 1, there would be two points or more here that would be assigned to the same point uh, in B, so you would not be able to define the inverse because you wouldn't know where to go back. Right? You would have multiple choices here. So that's why we need to require that it's 1 to 1. Okay, so there's a few important things to note here. First is that the domain of f gets exchanged with the range of the inverse, and also the range of f gets exchanged with the domain of the inverse. That makes sense from the little picture here. Uh, any point that is in the domain of f, so these are the points in a here, will now be in the range of f minus 1, because they'll, they'll be images of applying f minus 1 to a point in B. And similarly, the points that are in the range of f will now be in the domain of the inverse function. Okay, another thing that's important to note is that if I start by applying f to a point x, and then I apply the inverse function, well, I should go back to the same x, right? If I start here, apply f, apply the inverse back, I should go back to the same point, and that's true, as long as x is in the domain of f. Very important, in fact, this condition. We'll see why when we study, for example, inverse trig functions. And we have the opposite statement, so if I start with a point now in b, apply the inverse function, then apply my function, I should go back to x, so I start here, apply the inverse, go back to f, go back to x, as long as x is now in the domain of the inverse, or the range of f. Okay, and there's one last thing that I want to mention before we work through an example. Uh, it's just a notation thing, but that's very important. f minus 1 of x means the inverse function of x. It's not the same thing as taking the reciprocal of the function, which would be 1 over f of x. These are different things, very different. So it's very important you don't confuse the two notations. Okay, so let me now work through an example. Suppose that I'm given the function square root of minus x minus 1, and I want to find the inverse function f minus 1 of x. So the first thing you may want to do is calculate the domain and the range of the function, because these will become the range and the domain of the inverse function. So in this case, what is the domain of f? Well, f is the square root of something, so the something must be positive. So minus x minus 1 must be greater than 0, which implies that x must be less than minus 1. So in other words, the domain is all negative numbers less or equal to minus 1. And as for the range of f, well, f is the square root of a number, so the square root of a number is always a positive number, so the range here will be all positive numbers. Okay, and the next thing you want to do is to check that the function is one-to-one. -one. So here it is pretty clear. So the function is the square root of something. So for any two numbers, x1 and x2, the square root of any two different numbers are always different, right? So for any x1 not equal to x2, f of x1 will not be equal to x, f of x2. So the function is one-to-one. -one. Another thing I could do to check that the function is one-to-one -one is just sketch a graph of the function and check whether it passes the horizontal line test. So in this case, the function is a square root. It starts here at the point minus 1, 0, 
opens up on the negative side. So this is my function, f of x. And you see that it does indeed pass the horizontal line test because for any horizontal line here, they will intersect the function at most once or not intersect at all. Right, so it is a one-to-one -one function. Okay, that's good. Now, how can we find the inverse function? Well, like we call the definition, so if y is equal to f of x, so y is equal to f of x if and only if f inverse of y is equal to x. So what we want to do, so let me call this y here. So y is equal to some expression of x. To get the inverse, we want to inverse, invert this relation, right? We want to solve for x as a function of y. So let's do that. So I have y is equal to square root minus x minus 1. Well, to invert this relation, I'll first take the squares on both sides. So y squared is equal to minus x minus 1. And then I can solve for x. So I get x is equal to minus 1 minus y squared. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Now this is x as an expression of y. So that defines the inverse function, f inverse of y. Okay, so what we found here is that the inverse function as a function of y is minus 1 minus y squared. Now, pretty often, we prefer to write functions as functions of x. So what we want to do in the end is just exchange x and y to rewrite this as a function of x. So the inverse function as a function of x would be minus 1 minus x squared. And we can also calculate its domain and its range. That's actually quite important. So the domain of the inverse here will be equal to the range of f. So in this case, this is all positive numbers. And the range of the inverse will be the domain of f, which was negative numbers less or equal to minus 1. So you see that's quite important, because this function here, in principle, is defined for any real x. But the inverse function really is only for the positive x. right? Because the point is that this function here for all x would not be 1 to 1. So it's only 1 to 1 if you restrict its domain to positive x. So that's exactly what you get for the inverse function here. Okay, and you could also sketch the graph of what the inverse function looks like. Uh, so it's basically a parabola starting at the point 0, minus 1, and it opening downwards. But it's only the one half of the parabola for the positive uh, x's. So this would be f minus 1 of x. One thing that is also quite interesting to note here, which is a general feature for inverse function, is that if I draw the line y equals to x here, you see that the graph of f of x, or the graph of the inverse function, is, is the reflection of the graph of f of x along the line y equals to x. And that's always going to be true. And it makes sense, right? If you pick a point a, b here on the graph of f of x, what it means there is that f of a will be equal to b. Now, if f of a is equal to b, that means that f inverse of b will be equal to a. So in other words, the point b, a should be on the graph of the inverse function. So the graph of the inverse is always the reflection of the graph of the original function. All right, so before I summarize all of that, there's one thing I want to mention. So in the beginning, I told you that uh, you had to check that the function was one-to-one -to, -one to be able to define the inverse. Now here, the function was in indeed one-to-one, -one, so that was good. Sometimes it happens that the functions are not one-to-one. -one, so what you can do in this case, instead of just giving up, is to restrict the domain of the function so that it is one-to-one -one on this restricted domain. And then you can define the inverse function for this restricted original function. So this is something we'll have to do, for example, when we define inverse trig functions. Okay, so let me now summarize what we've seen in this video. So how can you calculate the inverse of a function f? So the first step is to calculate the domain and the range of f, because those will become the range and the domain of the inverse function. Second step is to check that f is a one-to-one -one function. If it's not, don't give up. What you can do is restrict the domain of f, so it becomes one-to-one -one on this restricted domain, and then try to calculate the inverse function for this restricted original function. Third step, well, you write y is equal to f of x. And now to invert the function, what you want to do is solve the equation for x as a function of y, if it is possible. And this will give you the inverse function x is equal to inverse f inverse of y. And finally, the fourth step, we generally prefer to write a function as a function of x, not y. So to write f inverse as a function of x, you interchange x and y, and you get y as being the f inverse of x. And the final thing to note, and it's always true, the graph of the inverse function is always obtained by reflecting the graph of the original function about the line y equals to x.